Look over at your neighbor and tell them, never give up on what God has spoken to you. Amen. Tell them that. Make that never give up on what God has spoken to you. Don't give up on your dream. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your business. Don't give up on your calling. Don't give up on what God has spoken to you. Pastor had former pastor. I don't even know how to introduce you anymore. I, Steve Reed. All right. My buddy, my brother from another mother. Um, you're going to be blessed today. Uh, Bob's class dismissed to go on downstairs. And um, uh, Steve, I want you guys to just uh, to lean in. This guy is a pastor to pastors now. This guy ministers to minister. They they uh, they have a what a story. You gonna, are you going to go back over what you went over some here in second service? What you, oh, dude, it was so good. And I'd heard the story before. I, I knew the story, but um, and that's the theme of just don't give up. How many all know that we live by what God has spoken to us, right? And so you don't give up. God's word is precious, and don't give up on what God has spoken to you, what God has promised to you. And um, so just say this real quickly. Steve and Susie have a, a ministry uh, in a little old place called Bethpage, uh, Missouri. Uh, Steve is also the mayor there. He'll explain more about that just in a moment. Uh, Self-appointed, we might add. It's kind of a dictatorship, but that's okay. Um, anyway, uh, uh, here's what they do. They, they have a, a beautiful big spring that comes up. Uh, in this big valley right behind their house and the brook that comes down out of there and they have cottages and these cottages now listen to this are free they're open to ministers to missionaries to come and just to refresh and re-strengthen and renew and that's their heart and their calling and what a what a walk and what a journey for you guys to get there and we're so proud of you so thankful for you marsh and i have been recipients of their love and of their kindness at the brook at beth page over there and so uh steve and susie was over with us last year in october when we done the ministers conference we had a bunch of different ministers and missionaries in here in-house and some have been down to visit with you guys uh for those that are watching i, I think you've got a group that's in there today that's watching live stream and so we want to say hi to the brook is it mom your mom is there and some of her group that is there. Mom, I need you to have a talk with him after this is over. If he acts like he did in the first service, you're going to need to visit with your son just a little bit. So they're watching the live stream as well as a bunch of others. It was a great time. Thank you guys for sharing him with us today and for Miss Susie. They're going to come and, and today is Mission Sunday. So we'll take up an offering for all of our missionaries and, and all of that like we do our orphanages and all of those things that... We support all around the globe, but uh, that'll be at the end of service. I want you to lean in now. Whenever God has called you to minister to ministers, he's put some things in your heart. And so I just want to encourage you. There's a depth of wisdom. There's a depth of knowledge and a depth of the word of God. And you're going to hear from somebody that hadn't give up. They pressed on through. We say this all the time at Westside. God's getting you ready for what he's got ready for you. So you're in that preparation. God's getting you ready. So give Steve and Susie Reed a hand as Steve comes going to share and love you, brother. Yeah, I told him first service, um, my, wife, I, my wife and I, we've been married now 42 years. Yeah. And uh, we've, we've been together ever since seventh grade, you know. And uh, so everybody asked me how I ended up with her, and I said, well, she's nearsighted, so I just stayed 30 feet away. <laughs> First time she saw me close up was the wedding day. It's too late then, you know. And so I <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we're in the Signs and Wonders ministry. She gives me signs. I wonder what they mean. <laughs> you know, so. and, uh, but um, but we, are, we are together in ministry more today than we've ever been, you know, with the, the Brook at Beth Page. I kind of share a little bit with you uh, about what the brook is, and the brook is exactly that. It's a place where those in full-time ministry can come and uh, stay for free, and we have these beautiful cottages. We call them cottages, and when people get there, they look and they go, this doesn't look like no cottage I ever saw, you know, because uh, they are very nice, and uh, they're very nice. They're very well kept. My wife does an awesome job cleaning them. Oh, my goodness, you know, it's like, uh, see, I can't clean them. I go in there, and she goes, how do they look? And I said, good. 
And she just looks at me like, mm-hmm, yeah. And uh, so she goes in there and makes sure they really look really nice, you know. And uh, But what we do is we have a love for pastors and for those in ministry because, you know, we've been there. We know how it is. We've been the good, bad, and the ugly of ministry. And um, I pastored for about 28 years. And uh, we, we grew up, I grew up uh, in the Southern Baptist Church. And I grew up, uh, and she grew up in the Assembly of God. So when we got together... <laughs> You know, we became Baptocostals, you know what I'm saying? And uh, so, <laughs> but, uh, but I, I ended up going to school at Rama out there and then uh, attended Bob Yandian's church and, and, and then went to Bob Yandian's school and then uh, Pastor Bob's the one that ordained me and all, and all that ministry. And uh, so, you know, we went back to our hometown uh, to start the first church, something I said I would never do. Both of us grew up, uh, I grew up in the, in, now, this is a big city. And so that's why, you know, you guys are going to have a little trouble accepting me because I am from the big town of Pilot Knob, Missouri. Right, right, yeah. And uh, yeah. 532 people. Yeah. <laughs> and then she grew up in the bigger city, Ironton, Missouri. You know, and so if you know that area over there, it's called the Arcadia Valley. And uh, so that's where we grew up. And so God sent us back there to start our first church. And, oh, Lord, I thought, Lord, they know me. You know, this is not going to work, you know. And... Uh, I, and you know, and and it was it was in a, it was a very good time. I mean, God really blessed it and everything else. Well, you know, here we were on Main Street, you know, in in Ironton, and uh, we had this uh, old building we'd rented, and uh, it didn't heat, it didn't cool, you know, nothing worked on it. So, what I did was um, I was praying one day. And this was in 1990, and I was praying, walking up and down the aisles, and you know, and and. Uh, uh, of the church and I, I said lord we just need another building lord we got to have something we're out of room it doesn't heat it doesn't cool you know we don't have any place for the kids you know the bathrooms were so tiny you know like sometimes if somebody get in there and get stuck you know yeah. it's like you know whoops <laughs> we, <laughs> and uh and that uh but it was just it was just not a good situation for church you know you want to make people as comfortable as you can so I'm walking up and down the aisles just praying, you know, and I'm like, oh, man, any day now the Lord's going to share this revelation with me of, you know, this building and all that, you know. So I'm walking up and down the aisles, and all of a sudden this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, one day you'll have a place where ministry can come and be restored and be refreshed, and you'll do it for free. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, That's great, but so what was that all about? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I'd never asked for anything like that thought about anything like that, did anything like that. And I was just like, you know, what in the world, you know? And so, you know, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, I still don't know what to do as far as church goes, you know? And, I mean, it is kind of dumb, you know? And I, and I hate to tell the Lord that, but, you know, sometimes you just speak honestly, you know, and you said, this isn't, uh, that ain't anything like I was asking you, you know? It's kind of like when your kids come in and ask you something and you go, you didn't wash your hands, did you? I didn't ask you anything about washing my hands. I asked about something else. Well, I know you didn't wash your hands. Get in there and wash your hands. And they're looking at you like, what's this got to do with anything I want to talk about? You know? And it was like, so I went home and told Susie. So now, that's 1990, you know? And, and I know with some of you that are in here today, and, and, you know, and sometimes people, they hesitate to talk about it because it may be some vision or a dream or something God dropped in your heart sounds too far-fetched. Maybe it sounds like something like, well, even if I shared this with people, they wouldn't believe me because they don't believe I could do something like that. And I got news for you, folks. You can't. There's nothing God ever asked me to do that I could do. <laughs> Not a thing, you know. I mean, he always asked me to do something. I'm like, Lord, I can't do that. And he's like, I know. That's why I told you. Because then you won't take them for credit for it, you know. You know, if you look at Moses, isn't it interesting? Moses thought he was ready, and he wasn't. Then he thought he wasn't ready, and he was. Isn't that cra crazy? But see, that's how God wants us, because if we think we can do it, then we won't ask for his help. And we'll say, don't worry, Lord, I got this. <laughs> how many of you know? He'll let us got it. You know? We can say, I got this, and he'll go, okay, go ahead. And I mean, I can mess something up. How many of you can mess something up in a matter of minutes? I mean, not even minutes, seconds, you know? I mean, I have never seen anything like it. I mean, I can, if second, I, I know the second I've walked out of that, letting God help me do something, and the second I've walked into it. So here it was, God spoke this to me, and some of you have had God speak something to you in a, 
about a dream or a, a vision or a ministry or something that you're supposed to do and maybe it just hasn't came to pass yet or maybe you've given up on it. Now, 1990, God, God speaks this to me about this, this place. And, and, you know, and, you, and, you know, when God speaks something to you, you know, you got all these visions of how you think it will be and how it's going to look and what you would do and, and all that. And, and I'm a visionary, so you've got to be real careful because, see, God knew who to put me with. Because, see, I'll come in, I'll tell Susie, Sue, so, this is what I'm going to build, yeah. like that. And she'll go, okay, you know, like that. Well, see, I'll be out there digging the footing with the shovel and getting it ready, and she'll walk out and go, what are you doing? Well, I'm building that. Did God tell you right now? Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe you ought to got, maybe get a tractor with a bucket. It might be easier than that shovel. Oh, and how do you know that this is even where God wants you to do that? Well, because something wasn't there. So if something's not there, you build something, you know. See, that's why, because I have a construction business, I'm always building something. So if I see something empty, I think something needs to sit there. Well, see, she comes along and makes me think about it a little bit. <laughs> like, have you thought about, you know, exactly how are you going to do this and how are you going to pay for that? Well, no. Then it's going to be kind of hard to finish, right? And so God knows who to put us with. So here's the thing about your vision and all that, too. It's very important to think about the other people around you and how they can benefit you. I know. Boy, that one goes over great with the husbands. Now, the wives knew it all along, see? But see, that's why God brought us this helper that stands beside us, that completes us. Because <laughs> we're just half done when we go by ourselves. You know what I'm saying? We just got about half of the thing going in the inside, okay? So, God gives this to me, and I'm thinking everywhere we pastored then, because, see, we pastored from... Now, now, think about this, all right? This is how funny God is, all right? We start off in Ironton, Missouri. God takes us from there to Orlando, Florida. From Orlando, Florida to Spokane, Washington. From Spokane, Washington to Sacramento, California. From Sacramento, California to Tulsa, Oklahoma. From Tulsa, Oklahoma to Madisonville, Kentucky. From Madisonville, Kentucky to Missouri. And we were already in Missouri. Now, some of you might think you're slow in here. But you're not as slow as me. Because I could have looked on the map and went, wait a minute, there's Ironton, and here's Beth Page. If we just get on Highway 60 and drive straight across, we'll run into it. But no, we have to go. And, uh-huh. I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, <laughs> that's where I got my training, yeah. And <laughs> but it's like you look and you go, like God, your roadmap is not the same as mine, because I could have showed you a lot shorter way. But how many of you know the shortest route is not always the best route, and it's not always the route you're going to learn the most on. So there were things that we had to learn, and things we had to go through, and things we had to face that prepared us for today. Now. So you get this vision, you get this thing that God wants you to do, and you're all excited and everything else. And then how many of you ever, God ever spoke something to you, and then it seemed like everything went just the opposite? Two of you. All right, so two of you are going to enjoy this today. The rest of you, I don't know. I, I don't know what time the buffet closes, but, you know, but anyway. But So God speaks something to you, or you get something that you, you believe you want to do, and it just looks like everything goes the opposite way. Well, now I want to bring you to, like with Susie and I and kind of our journey, okay? And we'll get to Scripture verses in just a second. I got plenty of Scripture verses for you to look at. But it's like, so we go 1990. Now we jump ahead to 2010, okay? So that's only 20 years. So all of a sudden, we get a phone call one day, and they said this. How would you and Susie like to have the Brook at Beth Page, this ministry retreat. Now, I'm on the phone with them, see, and see, when you're in ministry, you got to act cool 
and you got to act like, you know, you knew this all along that they's going to be calling. And so whenever they call, you go like this. You go, uh, yes, that would be great. And then I look over at Susie. I'm like, <laughs> the Brooke at Beth Page. Yes, I know what you're talking about. And so God spoke to you and he spoke to you about us. That would be great. We would love to talk to you about it. Because we all know what we're doing. You know, you got to act cool, but at the same time, you're about to jump out of your skin. Because finally, we're like, yes, this is going to be so cool. Because we knew about the brook, and we knew what it looked like. And we knew, we're like going, oh my gosh, we're going. So, at that time, I'm pastoring in Kentucky. So I told my board what was going on. They already knew what we were called to. We'd talked to them about it before, how one of these days I knew that's what God was going to have me doing. So when I talked to the board, they're all sitting there, and they're behind us 100% and said, Pastor, we hate to lose you, but we know at the same time this is what you're called to do. So I step down from pastoring, and I get you know done there, and I, and I have a construction business, so I close it down, and we're getting ready to move. And I mean, we're getting ready. We're getting ready to go. And I'll tell you the rest of the story in a minute, okay? Let's go to Scripture verses, okay? Now, if you go, if you go over to uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, okay? And I told them earlier, I said, that's in the Old Testament. And you'll have people tell you, you know, well, I had this one pastor one time told me, he said, I never teach out of the Old Testament. I said, why not? He said, well, there's no grace there. I looked at him and I said, I wanted to go, here's your sign. You know what I'm saying? But I wanted to say, there's grace all through the Old Testament. I I know it's where they got the law and everything, but there's the grace of God all through it. And I I brought out just one person. I said, take David. I said, here's a guy. Slept with another man's wife. Got her pregnant. Then tried to trick him into sleeping with her so he he could say it's his baby. And then when he wouldn't sleep with her, then he had him killed. And then he wanted to be the uh, hero, so he took her as his wife, so the child would have a father. And he wanted to act like nothing ever happened until he got caught. And but yet, God still used him. Isn't it something? Now, is that not the grace of God? That's one of the greatest examples of the grace of God that was ever in the Word. And then God even says, he, you know, he's the apple of my eye. I just love that boy. Well, we're looking like, do you know what he did? He goes, yeah, I was that. I saw the whole thing, even though they're in the dark. You ever notice how people turn off the lights? They don't think God can see them. (laughs) We had this one lady one time. She went to our church. She was having such a struggle, man. She was coming out of the bar singing, you know. And so... One time we're going down to Susie's mom's house, and I turned there in Ironton. There used to be this bar there called Yancey's Bar. I say, Pastor, how do you know that? Well, I wasn't always a pastor. <laughs> All right? But it was gone. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like I was working for this guy. Now, listen, this. I'm, uh, okay, here I am pastor, and I got a construction business, and I built a bar for a guy, a tavern. Oh, I know. I lost some of you right there. And he's like, what? Yeah. Well, I'm in there, you know, because now I'm, I, I built the whole bar. Out of hand. I mean, hand built it and everything. This one guy walks in and goes, how do you know how to build a bar? And I said, oh, I wasn't always in the ministry. I know what a bar looks like, you know. Well, anyway, here we're this in Yancey's Tavern. We're going down to her mom's. And all of a sudden, I look over, and this lady from our church is just struggling so much. She's sitting in the bar, and she's just glowing. You can just see her right through the front window. She's sitting in front of the Bud Light sign. <laughs> So everybody drove by there. There she was, you know, again. So I dropped Susie's mom. Susie offered her mom's. I walked back down to the tavern. I stood at the front door, and I looked in there, and I looked at her, and I went, I can't. She comes walking out. She goes, hi, Pastor. I said, hi. She goes, how'd you know I was here? I said, the Bud Light sign. She goes, what do you mean? I said, you're sitting right in front of it. I said, if you're going to go in there, turn the light off. She just looked at me. She's like, oh, man, you know. Okay, and I said, yeah. 
I said, you know, the reason why people turn lights off. But how many you know God always sees you? You know? And so, you know. <laughs> oh, my Lord. You're going to get so many cards and letters this week. <laughs> I can just see them, you know. Pastor Dave. I don't ever have him back. I don't know who he was. Lord have mercy. <laughs> but <laughs> if you know, listen. All right, this is why I look at it. Okay, folks, let me tell you something. See, some people think, you know, because you're, you laugh all the time or you're full of joy, your life's just been great. Right. Listen, I went through so much stuff you wouldn't even know. You know what I'm saying? Right. But here's the thing. I found the joy of the Lord is my strength. Right. Right. And I am telling you what. Hey, listen. I went, uh, okay. When, uh, <laughs> okay. If you walk, I, I want you to try this in the morning. I don't care what kind of mood you get up in. You walk to the mirror, look at yourself, and tell your face you're saved. Yeah. <laughs> you can't help but laugh. Yeah, yeah. Your, face, your, your face will try its best. Just, happy, yeah. you know, pretty soon it just got a big old smile on his face. You just tell yourself, I'm saved. Yeah. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the apple of his eye. Yeah. You can't stay sad. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We all have bad things happen. But it's like God, in his mercy, what he's given to us is he's given us this medicine called laughter. Yeah. Amen. Come on. They just make your heart just merry and just say, man, this is great. Good Why? Good. Because not only am I, am I living now, but I get to spend eternity with him. Yeah. Woo! Man. Okay, here we go. So we're going to go to scripture verses. So here we are, you know, we're getting ready to leave and do all this, and we find out we're going to the brook. Okay? And this is our lifelong dream. Now, in 2 Kings chapter 4, look in verse 8. It says, Now it happened one day that Elisha, and we all know who Elisha was, man, one of the most powerful prophets there was, anointed by God, you know. He says, Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. Now, that word notable in the, in the Hebrew means this. It means someone of integrity, honor, someone everybody respected and everybody listened to and wanted to hear what this woman had to say. Because she was just somebody you could trust. And she would just tell you the truth. She'd tell you the way it was. And she was just this woman that everybody knew her. If you mentioned her name, she'd have this good reputation from everybody. Nobody had anything bad to say about her. Great lady. Okay. Now listen to this. She said, it, and, and I love this too, so it says, so it was she persuaded him. Now, she was one of these people who go, hey, listen, I've noticed you've been walking by here a lot and been coming into town. Next time you come, you're going to eat with us. You hear me? Oh, no, ma'am, that's not, no, I, maybe you didn't hear me. You're going to eat with us. Right. No, ma'am, that's a, okay. I'm only going to say this one more time. <laughs> you're going to be eating with us, okay? Oh, well, okay. And so once he tasted her food, it must have been all right because every time it says he came by there, he came in there to eat. I mean, you know, <clears throat> it's kind of like this. John Kennedy said it this way. He said, there's some people that light up a room when they come in and some people light it up when they leave. <laughs> Amen? I mean, you know, there's just sometimes there's people you want to be around and there's other people you go, whoo, you know, I get. So be one of those people that light it up when you come in, you know? Okay? So... It says, and he would turn in there to eat some food. Verse 9. And she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes us regularly. All right. Now, this is probably pretty sad, but this is the way it mainly goes, you know. Isn't it sad the woman has to notice the anointing on the guy? I know. That always goes over great. You know what I'm saying? But I got to tell you something the Lord told me one time about this and about, because I, I'd ask the Lord different times. I said, God, why in the world did you speak to me about doing this retreat thing? Because there's a lot of pastors I don't like. <laughs> I mean, I'll just be honest with you, you know. I mean, and I, hey, I worked in the lumberyard. My dad had a lumberyard. And we had those preachers that'd come in, and they'd go like this, come walking through the door, and they thought they was the closest thing to God there ever was. And they'd go like this, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm needing some table fours, and what's my discount? I'd look at them, I'd say, well, we add 50% and then take off 10 They never did get it. They'd always think you're serious. You're doing what? I'm a man of God. I said, yeah, if you're a man of God, you wouldn't be asking me for a discount. You'd already know I'd give you one. Right? See, if God tells me to give you one, that's great. But to come in here and say, you should give me one because of this, 
I told this one preacher one time, I said, why shouldn't I give it to everybody that's a born-again Christian? Hmm? I know, boy, it just goes over like a lead balloon. You ought to, you ought to preach that at a pastor's conference. Yeah. You don't ever get asked back. Yeah. <laughs> they won't ever have you back. It's like, you know, ah, no. You know, I can't. But see, she, in, she noticed, and he said this, this is what the Lord told me. He said, the reason why I'm having you do that is because you notice the anointing on men and women. You know their anointing, and you respect that. When somebody's truly anointed by God and they're called by God, yeah, there needs to be a recognition of that. But also you need to know how to treat those people. You know what I'm saying? Because they are worthy of our respect. They're worthy of honor. You know what I'm saying? And they do a hard job. Listen, I pastored for 28 years. Man, I'm telling you what. There was times that we were good and there were times that it was bad. And there were times that I wish I was doing something else. I'll just be honest with you. And there were times whenever I'd go, Lord, it can't get any better than this. And then the next week, I'd say, take me home, Jesus. Okay? Because I know. That, now, here, I'm not slamming all of you, but this is how we all are. Have you ever noticed how fickle we are? I'll go over on this side. Have you ever noticed how fickle we are? <laughs> I mean, we can just be perfect one second, and then the next second just be like squirrely. And you're like going, what just happened? You know, I mean, Susie and I was talking about that the other day. You know, it's like, you know, how, how we just, we can just change in our mood and different things like that. And it all depends. And sometimes people do walk in and they say, okay, bless me if you can. And then other times they'll hit the door and go, woo, pastor, I've been in prayer all week. Woohoo, glory to God. You know, like that. And you're like, whoa, what did you do to my member? You know what I'm saying? But it's like as pastoring, it is a hard job, you know. It takes a lot of commitment. It takes a lot of, you got to know that you're called. Because if you don't know that you're called, you won't continue. And you will. And now listen to this. This is a staggering statistic. But because we're in this, this, this ministry, we know that these are true. Now listen to these statistics now. Do you know 10% of all ministers will retire as a minister? 10%. That's it. Out of the... 1,200 a month pastors that go in the ministry every month, 1,200 a month enter the ministry, 1,500 quit. 1,500 a month quit in the United States alone. That's it. And out of that 1,500 that quit, over half of them will never go in ministry again of any kind. None. They, and now listen, and the half of them that don't will not go back to church. Never attend church again. That's it. Now, do they still love God? Yeah. Do they still worship Jesus? Yes. they still read their Bibles? Yes. Still give? Yep. Don't want to have anything to do with church. Out of the 1,200 a month that start ministry, 55% don't last one year. They quit. That's in the United States. That's only in the United States. That's no other place else. Now, this is what's, and, and we wonder then, well, what's the problem? They must not have been called. <laughs> Listen, I want to tell you something right now. <clears throat> All we ever see is the big boys on TV. You know what I'm saying? The ones that have, you know, and they're on there, and they've got the shiny teeth, and, you know, and they, when they smile at you, it sparkles, you know. And they're blazing with both guns, and, you know, it's like, hey, 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 I'm here, you know. And, I, you know, and everyone's got their own theme music on. ba bum ba bum but I'm, but I'm, but I'm here to lay some gospel on you, you know. Everybody's like, whoa, whoa, touch me, touch me. Mm. But I want to tell you something right now. The best Bible teachers there are are in these rural communities that teach the Word of God, period. They just teach the Word. They don't care about all the flair, all the flame, all the, all the other junk that goes on. They just want to teach the Word. Yeah. But a lot of it today is put so much pressure on some of these smaller communities and smaller areas, the pastors feel like they have to compete with the mega churches. You know what I'm saying? Because they have swimming pools and movie stars and, you know, and all that good kind of stuff. And they can do anything. They got so much money, you know. 
And so a lot of your rural pastors, and that's mainly what we minister to at the brook, is a lot of them come and they don't feel, and listen, out of the pastors, now these same statistics, and I know these are hard to believe, but now you've got to remember, there's not a, out of the mega churches, that's not a whole lot of the body of Christ. Most of the body of Christ is made up out of rural churches. In most churches, 85% of the pastors in rural churches do not feel like their words mean anything to anybody and they're not helping anybody at all. They just feel like they're being totally ineffective, you know, at all with their ministry. But some of them don't know what to do. You know, they don't know what else to do. And sometimes they just need to come to the brook just for, just to get some encouragement. You know, and just find out that, hey, wait a minute, I can do this. God has called me, you know. And I just need to get away to kind of find myself again and find my identity in Christ and not in the size of my church, you know. And so that recognizing the anointing, too, and seeing the anointing on these men and women of God, it doesn't matter about the size of their church. It doesn't matter what town they come from. It's just who they are in Christ and what God wants to do through them. Amen. So she does this, and she says, This man comes by regular. Please, let us make him, in verse 10 of, this, of 2 Kings chapter 4, Please, let us make an upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand so it will be whenever he comes, he can turn in there. Now, <clears throat> keep this in the back of your mind because things that you do today prepare you for things that are going to happen in your future that are miracles. I mean, it's, a, it's amazing. It's amazing how many times Susie and I can look back on things that God had us to do in the past, and all of a sudden now we're using them right now, and it's, and it's bringing victory into our lives. Do you realize that for years, listen, we're, like, we're just like you all, and that we sowed and sowed and sowed and sowed and sowed for years, and really didn't, you know, we weren't making any big money or anything like that. We wasn't really seeing any big-time results, you know, like we wasn't buying us planes and all that kind of stuff, you know. But we just knew that we needed to be faithful in our finances. And what you find out is, and this is, this is what's so cool, is then when you need it, you have sown that seed that God brings in what you need, and he brings it in abundance. And you're just like, wow, this is so cool. Because this is from seed that we sowed years ago. And now when we need it, it's there. Okay? And so you see this lady, she prepares this bed, this room for the prophet, and she doesn't realize it's going to be used later for a miracle in her life. And listen to this. It says, <clears throat> and it happened one day, whenever he comes, he can turn in there. And it happened one day, verse 11, that he came there and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite woman. When he had called her, she stood before him. And he, and, and he said to him, say now to her, look, you have been concerned with us with all this care. What can I do for you? There's something else you find out. If you don't get nothing else out of this, if you become a servant, a servant to people, servant to your church, servant to your pastors, servant to those you serve in, listen, you start serving people, there's rewards in it. People ask us all the time, that there are things that we have to do for people that a lot of people in ministry would not do. I remember the first time I was pastor in church, and I'm cleaning the toilets. You know, I got a scrub brush, I'm cleaning them. All of a sudden, I come walking out of the bathroom because somebody came in the front door, and this guy's standing there, he goes, what are you doing? I said, what do you think I'm doing? He goes, well, it looks like to me, you're cleaning toilet stools. And I said, that's exactly what I'm doing. That's why I got a toilet brush. He said, why are you doing that? I said, well, because they're dirty. And there's stains in there. It looks nasty. And I'm cleaning them. He goes, no, that's not what I mean. Why are you doing it? Because you shouldn't be doing it. You're the pastor. And I said, no, that's exactly why I should be doing it. Because if I'm asking somebody else to do something I won't do, that's wrong. Because everything I see in the Word, Jesus, everything He asked us to do, He was willing to do Himself. 
And I said, now, that doesn't mean I go in there and just say, well, if you're not a good pastor, if you don't clean toilets. No, I'm saying, as a pastor, I saw the toilets need to be cleaned and there wasn't anybody that could do it, so I scrubbed the toilets. I didn't see any big deal in it, you know. But you see, if you have an attitude like, well, I'm not scrubbed toilets, then guess what? God ain't going to use you. That's what I tell people. I say, hey, I'm real blunt with people. When I was pastoring, I'd have people tell me, said, I don't believe in tithing. And I said, okay. Well, I'm not going to give then. I said, okay. Well, what else you got to say about that? You dumb. <laughs> what else are you going to tell them? You dumb if you don't. Because if you want to be blessed, you'll be a giver. If you want to be somebody who God goes out of his way to find a way to bless you, you'll be a servant. If you don't want to serve, guess what? You'll always struggle. There is one thing that I don't lay awake at night and wonder or anything else. And listen, folks, it's got nothing to do with the size of your bank account. I don't lay awake at night wondering how God's going to provide for us. I sleep the same whether I've got $10 in the bank or $10,000 in the bank. It doesn't make any difference. Because I know he's always been faithful. He has always been one that brought us whatever we needed, whatever time we needed, or whatever. But I knew something else. We've been faithful to him. And we've been obedient. Whatever he needs us to do, we just do it. And that's what God is looking for today. He's not looking for all the fancy smoke and all that kind of stuff. He just wants faithful people. He just wants obedient people. He just wants somebody that just says, hey, God, what is your will? I'm, I want to do it. Amen. And here he says, you have been so concerned with us. What can I do, do for you? Do you want me to speak to the, to, on your behalf to the king? Or do you want the, to me to speak to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. Now, see, I told him earlier, I said, that was, I, when I first read that, I thought, what kind of answer is that? But what she meant was this. Remember earlier when we read she was a notable woman? Everybody trusted her, knew her. Why did she need somebody else to speak for her? If she wanted something, she could just go to the king and tell him. Exactly. She could go to the commander of the army and tell him. And because of her notability and because she was the kind of woman she was, they would have tried to help her out. She goes, I don't, I don't need your help. Now, you see, this is what so many times, you know, people think it's, you know, and, and God will use people in your life. There's no problem. But don't depend on people in your life. I don't know how to say that. I'm trying to be as nice as I can. But this is what Susie and I have found out. <clears throat> now, I'm going to tell you a story. I don't tell this many places. And because you guys won't even know who I'm talking about. But when I took a church one time, I had this guy inviting me to lunch. And this guy was one of the wealthiest men <clears throat> in a company. That, uh, I mean, he was one of the wealthiest, okay? So he invites me to lunch, and he went to church at this church. And he said, uh, I just wanted to talk to you about the church and the direction, you know, and all that. He says, uh, I would like for the church to stay going in the direction it's going. Well, it wasn't going to because they were going in the wrong direction. So I told him, I said, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, what's that? And I said, I'm going to obey God. And all of a sudden, he reaches down in this briefcase, and he brings out an envelope, and I don't know how much money was in there, but it was a stack. And he took the envelope, and he slid it across the table, and he said, that's what I want you to do. I want you to obey God. And then he winked. Now, I would love to tell you that Steve Reed was so spiritual then I looked down at that money, and I said, you filthy lucre. Get thee behind me. And I took my, no, I wouldn't have a lighter, but I took a lighter, and I lit the thing on fire and burned it up. But no, I looked down at that stack, and I was like, holy cow. I wonder how much is in there. Can I count it? Maybe if I count it. All of a sudden, the Lord said, do not open that envelope up. So I slid it back across the table like that. And he slides it back. And he said, just obey God. And he winked again. And I slid it back to him. And I said, 
I am going to obey God. And he goes, I hope you know what you're doing. And I said, well, I think I do. I said, I guess we're going to find out. So he put his envelope back in his briefcase. And this day, I don't know how much was in there. But all I can tell you is this. Till I got there, he had financed that whole church to the tune of about 10000 a week that he gave personally on top of 350000 he had put in an account to build an amphitheater. Plus, he was buying the path of the pastor, Jaguars and all that kind of stuff. Now, I should have held out for a Jaguar, but I didn't. <laughs> if I had it to do over, I might just go for the Jag, baby. <laughs> I could have repented after, you know. <laughs> but no, I, I, I'll tell you, folks, but see, that's the thing, you know. It was like, what could he have done for me? But then here's what happens. When you do that, then they say, I made Steve Reed rich. I put Steve Reed in this position. I made sure his church was paid for. I made sure this. So you see, she looked at him and said, what can you do for me that I can't do for myself if I trust God? Hey, okay, now listen to this. He says, so he said, what then is to be done for her? In other words, he was just shocked because you got to remember when a prophet looked at you and said, what do you want me to do for you? Every time he had ever done that before, people had taken him up on it. Well, can you pray for God for me? And, you know, I really need about $10,000. How about that? Uh, could you make sure this is done over here? Now he's got somebody that says, I don't need you. I've got God. Okay? So he says, and Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. So he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Now, let me tell you some things about this lady. Not only was she a notable woman, and she was someone of integrity, and she's someone of honesty, but she was also somebody who knew not to go in his room, but to stay in the doorway. She protected herself from any kind of gossip, slander, or any of those things, she stayed in the doorway. She said, I can hear you from here. Listen, I've counseled with many people that have committed adultery, and it never happens because they stayed in the doorway. It happens because they entered the room. And it's when you take that step inside, and you know you've went too far, it's like, hey, I don't need to be in the same room with this guy. I can stay in the doorway and hear him just fine. You know what that also does? It doesn't tempt the prophet either. You see what I'm saying? See, that's why you always got to guard yourself. You always got to be on guard because the enemy is always trying to lay a trap for you. Even if you don't do anything wrong, it's the appearance of evil. Right. Amen. And so you just got to protect yourself at all times. Amen. When I was traveling all the time and ministering, I had to do this on a constant basis. You know what I'm saying? Because there was one hotel I stayed at in uh, Arizona. And the TV, when you turn it on, it automatically came on the X-rated channels. I called down the front desk. I said, what is going on here? Oh, well, that, that's just the way our TVs are. And I said, well, yeah, this one ain't going to be that way. She goes, well, we can't do anything about that. And I said, you've got a service guy around here, somebody, that can come down here and work on this TV. And she goes, no, we don't. I said, okay. <coughs> send uh, your maintenance guy down here in about 15 minutes because your TV will be sitting outside. She goes, well, you can't go unhooking our TV. And I said, yes, I can. i got tools in my car. So I'll have her unhooked in about five minutes and be sitting outside your door. She goes, well, you can't do that. And uh, you know what? Five minutes later, my TV didn't get any X-rated channels. I told her, I said, uh-uh, no, I ain't gonna be, that ain't going to happen because then that opens up the door for somebody to say something. Even if you didn't do it. And so you have to be on guard all the time. And listen what it says. It says she stood in the doorway. Then he said in verse 16. About this time next year you shall embrace a son. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I mean here she is. She's old. She doesn't have any kids. And the next thing you know he says you're going to embrace a son now. Okay now listen to this. I love her response. 
And she said, No, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. In other words, not only was this woman integrity, honesty, she's bold. She didn't just accept every word that came down the pike. She said, listen, in other words, I could paraphrase this way. Hey, old man, you better not be lying to me. Because you go telling me something like that just because that's what you think I want to hear. I mean, you're going to have some problems. Right? And how many of you have ever, you've seen this before. How many of you, <laughs> I've been around people like this. They got a word for everybody. Come here, I got a word for you. I got a word for you, too. I got a word for you. Yeah. And you start listening to them, and you're like, boy, they awful sound awful lot alike. Yeah. And it's always one of these about, God's going to bless you. Woo! He's going to bring so much money into you, but you're not even going to know how to spend it all. Yeah. Well, who don't like something like that? Yeah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. You know, give it to me. Yeah. But how many of you know not all words are from God? And that's all she wants to know. She says, don't just tell me something because you think that's what I want to hear. I want to know that it's God. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And so listen to this. Now, I, I'm, a true, I'm a strong believer in this. If God really said it, it's going to happen. Just the way it is. Right. Okay? And notice what it says. He says, now notice how specific he is. He says, about this time next year you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant, but... The woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come. See, if it's truly God, he won't give you generalities like, uh, yeah, sometime in the future now, I don't know when it'll be, probably, you know, oh, before you die. Well, Lord, you wait your whole life going, you know, well, all right, I'm on my deathbed. It still hasn't happened. I mean, you know, God will get real specific about things. And he'll start telling you things, and the next thing you know, it's like, whoa, you know. Now listen to this. She had, so when the appointed time had come, and Elisha was told, that had, of which Elisha had told her, and the child grew, now it happened one day that he went out into the, with his father to the reapers, and he said to his father, my head, my head. So he said to his servant, carry him to his mother. Now, let me go back to... Our phone call about the brook. And so here, 1990, the Lord tells me we're going to get this place. And it's going to be for ministers and, you know, and all this. And, and one of these days we're going to do it. And we're going to do it for free, you know, and all that. And I, and I keep waiting, keep watching and everything else. And then all of a sudden the phone call comes. It says, how would you like the brook? And, you know, and yes, you know. So I quit my church, closed down my, my, closing down my business. We're getting ready to go. And then we get another phone call. And this phone call is like, hey, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing great. Man, we're getting ready to go to the brook. Well, I got some bad news for you. What's the bad news? Well, we talked to our board, and they decided there's some other ministries they'd like to have to have the brook besides you. And that's when I was crying, my head, my head. I was getting ready to go down there. And I was getting ready to leave everything and go to the brook. And now we get a phone call. And listen what it says about her child. He says, my head, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knee at till noon and then died. So here you are. It's 2010. You get a phone call about the brook. And then all of a sudden... They're like, uh, there's some other ministries that want it. And it's like, my head, my head. And they said, what we're going to do is have all of you write a proposal. There's seven other ministries besides yours. Now, all these other seven ministries, if I named the ministries to you, you'd know every one of them. They are big time international ministries, multi million dollar ministries. And then there's Steve and Susie. <laughs> We're going to have some fun now, you know. And they're wanting us to write a proposal up. So we wrote proposals, all right. So they said, what we're going to do is we're going to meet the brook and with our, stat, with our board. Said the first day we're going to narrow it down to four. And the second day by noon down to two. And then by that afternoon we'll have who we're going to give it to. And we're like, okay, great. So they met the first day. 
And they narrowed it down to four, and they called us and said, good news, you're in the top four. And we're like, you know, it's that phone call again where you're going like, well, that's wonderful. That's great. You know, like that. We'll be praying the rest of the day. <laughs> you know, like that. So we hang up. Call us back at noon the next day. Got good news. There's two left, and you're one of the ministries. We're like, yes. That afternoon, they called and said, well, we got bad news. Like, what is it? The child's dead. We gave it to somebody else. And I had to act real cool, and I hung up the phone, and I was devastated. I said, God, I don't understand. Why would you give me all this vision, tell me all these things, and now all of a sudden, it's gone. So Susie and I had planned a trip down to Florida, okay? And I'll get back to that in just a second. I want to show you what happens next. It says, then the child died. And the Lord said, to, to me, the scripture verses, and he said this. He said, Steve, what this woman does next will determine the future, her future outcome. But what you do next will determine yours. And notice what it says. It says, And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. And the Lord said, Notice she didn't bury her son. She took him and put him up on the bed of the prophet. Now, that's important for this reason. Remember earlier, she thought the room was for the prophet to turn in and sleep, which it was. But notice now the room's going to serve a different purpose. And it's going to bring another miracle into her life. So here it is, 2010. We get the phone call. huh? Yeah, and isn't that interesting? I'm glad you brought that out. And it says, and look what it says. And you laid him on the, man of God, the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. Why would she shut the door? So she didn't see her dead son laying there. She wanted to remember him alive. So she shut the door and went out. Now, here's the thing. Susie and I get that phone call, and we'd had a trip planned to Florida. And she goes, are we still going on our trip? And I said, yeah, I want to get out of here. Because I knew what would be happening. you got to remember now, we're in a small town in Kentucky. They all know we're leaving. We've told everybody we're leaving. I know now what's going to happen. Well, guess you didn't hear from God, did you? Well, you're not gone, are you? You still here? I told her, I said, let's just go on down to Florida. So we did. We went to Fort Walton Beach. We got up Sunday morning. We went to this church called Emerald Coast Christian Center. We'd never been there before. The pastor was Charlie Anderson, was the pastor. Never been there before. And I told her, I said, I just want to go. I don't want nobody to know I'm, I'm even in ministry. So I wore shorts, flip-flops, T-shirt, didn't even take my Bible. Told him earlier service, if I could have, I'd have wore a Speedo. That's how rebellious I was. <laughs> I know, Mama's watching. Mama, I'm sorry about that. My mama right now, she's so red-faced. Oh, my God, I can't believe he said that, you know. But, I, I mean, I was. I was and, I, and I have to admit now, I wouldn't have admitted it then. I was mad at God. I mean, I was hurt. I didn't understand why my father was doing that. God, why are you keeping me from the vision that you've given me, that dream you've given me? Why have you done this, you know? So we get down there in church, and we're sitting near the back, and it's a large church, you know. And the pastor comes out. They did worship, and the pastor comes out. And <clears throat> he starts teaching. And all of a sudden, he just in the, he stopped in the aisle. And he looked back like this, and he said, Man of God, you can't hide from God. And I thought he was talking to like a friend of his or something. I'm looking around, and I look back around. I said, and he goes, I'm talking to you. And I said, me? And he goes, yeah. yeah. And then he just starts to cry, you know. And he said, you've had something very devastating happen. He said, you were given some news that you weren't expecting. Yeah. Folks, I've told this story I don't know how many times, and I cannot keep, because it's, it's like it happened yesterday. It's like it happened yesterday. And he said, I, 
feel like God wants me to tell you something. He said, it's not over yet. He said, it's not over yet. He said, you're not to give up. And I was just, by that time, I'm bawling, he's bawling. He's telling me all kinds of other stuff, you know, and all that. And we got done, and after church, I told him about what had happened to us. He goes, well, son, all I'm telling you is it's not over. It's not over. I said, okay. So I walk out of there, and we did whatever Christian does. It leaves church on Sunday. We went to Walmart because there were some supplies we had to pick up. And I'm standing in line. I got my little bit of stuff, you know, and I'm still thinking about what all happened in the church service and everything, you know. All of a sudden, this lady walks up behind me, and she goes, sir. I said, yes, ma'am. She goes, I've never done this ever before in my life. She said, I'm so nervous, you know, but I feel like I'm supposed to tell you something. And she said, and I said, okay. And she said, I feel like the Lord told me that you're, it's not over yet. You're not supposed to give up. And so here I am standing in Walmart, you know, <laughs> and I'm like going, oh, Lord, you know, I'm about to fall apart here, you know. So I just paid for my stuff, told Susie what happened, you know, and all that. But from then on, like Vic Porter was the next one I called. I told him what happened. He goes, well, son, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not over yet. I'm telling you. Then Bob Yandy and I called my pastor. I said, Pastor Bob, I said, you know, this is what happened. He goes, well, it's not over yet, is it? I was like, no. And you got to remember, you know, if you've ever known Pastor Bob, he's just blunt as they like, come, you know. He goes, you're still breathing, aren't you? And I was like, yeah. Here I'm wanting him to feel sorry for me, you know, a little bit. Pastor Bob ain't going to do that, you know. And I'm like, feel sorry for me. You know, like, cry with me or whatever. He goes, well, if you're still breathing, it ain't over yet. So just don't worry about it. I'm like, well, I'll call on you again. Find me another pastor. Somebody to cry with me. You know what I'm saying? You won't even go to the pity party, you know. And so, but everywhere I turned, you know, that's what I was getting, you know, was do not bury that dream. Do not put it to rest and say, that's it. You know what I'm saying? And see, many of you probably in that same spot where there was something you believe in God for or something you was trusting for. There's something, either a job or a business or something like that. Now, listen, I'm going to tell you something right now, please. There are times God might tell you to start a business, and that does not mean that that business is going to go just gung-ho right off the bat because you've also got an enemy fighting you. So that doesn't mean everything's just going to work out just perfect and everything else, but it does mean this. If God told you, that's what you're supposed to do. And if you do, be obedient and do what he told you and, and bless other people through that business, it will grow. Yes, it will. And it will astound you what God will do and the business he'll bring you and the customers and everything else. I mean, with our construction business, it's just amazing to me every day how I see how God just blesses that and how he brings us customers. But it's just amazing how it happens. And it's a supernatural thing. If I got customers the way everybody else did, what does, what's that? Any big deal. If I advertised and did it like everybody else, and I said, yeah, I advertised on such and such, and look, it worked out for me. But when you don't advertise or anything, and God still gets your name out there, it's a supernatural thing, you know? Amen. Now, listen to this. It says, and she went, she shut the door behind her, and she went out, verse 22. Then she called her husband and said, please send me one of your young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. So he said, why are you going to him today? Is it, it's neither the new moon or the Sabbath. And she said, it is well. <laughs> and the Lord showed us over and over again, folks, with this woman here, all of her integrity, all of her honesty, the what kind of woman she was, but her confession. She kept her words out of her mouth right. She kept one of the things that Susie and I would do is, you know, <clears throat> Here we got told that, you know, we wasn't going to get the brook. And we'd be sitting on our patio there in Madisonville, and we'd be drinking our, our coffee or whatever in the mornings, and I'd say, you know, the only thing that's going to make this better. She said, well, and I said, we're doing it at the brook. Like that. Because it was like, I, you know, I just, I just, there was just something inside of me. I could not turn it loose. I couldn't let it go. Okay? Now listen to this says, it is well. Then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. 
And so she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. Now let me tell you how amazing all this is with the brook and everything else. Guess what road the brook is on? Mount Carmel Road. Okay? Now, when the Lord was telling me about the brook and, and, and telling us we were going to get it, everything else and, and just blessing us, I, I asked the Lord one time, I said, Lord, what I don't understand is why did you pick me to do this? Because I never prayed about it. I never like that. And he said, Steve, this is your destiny. So guess what road goes from Mount Carmel Road up to the cottages? We didn't name it. They did. It's called Destiny Lane. And so everything about everything we do, you know, and everything else, it just comes right back to if anybody was called to a ministry, this is what we're called to. And I, and, and, and I got to throw this out there. Susie and I are both six years old, okay? And I'm not in the best of shape, you know what I'm saying? I got one shape, and it's round, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, but here's the thing. I believe because we're willing to do the work at the brook that is, that's called for us. You ought to see the work we do every day, plus on top of what all the other, other things we do, that Susie and I do all that work. I mean, we eat, mow, she cleans, everything else. And we're, we have, but physically, we're able to do that. And I believe God blesses us with physical health to be able, because we've been obedient just to do what he tells us to do. Because we go back to our class reunions. <laughs> Most of them are walking like this. <laughs> you know, you look at them like, what in the world's up with you? Oh, I'm retiring. Why are you retiring? Well, because I put in my 40 years or 45 years or whatever, had a job I hated, so I can retire. I said, well, what are you going to do when you retire? Don't know. I said, and I always tell all of them the same now. I said, well, come down to the brook. I'll give you something to do. Yeah, yeah. But I really believe that God gives us that strength that we need to fulfill whatever ministry it is that he calls us to. I really believe that. Amen. Now, look at what it says here. <clears throat> it says in, uh, so it says, so it was when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to his servant Gehazi, look, the Shunammite woman. Please run and meet her and say to her, <coughs> is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she said, it is well. Okay. Now, when she had came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near and pushed her away. But the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. So she said, did I ask a son of my Lord? When I read that, the Lord posed this question to me. I read that not paying any attention. All of a sudden, the Lord said, Steve, did you ask me for a place for pastors? I said, no. He said, I told you you would have a place for those pastors. He said, so if I told you, then I have to bring it to pass. Now, if that would have been my idea and my plan, then I would have had to have done it. I would have had to come up with it. I would have had to come up with the buildings. I would have had to come up with the land. I would have had to have done all that. But he said, I told you that I was going to do this. And I love what this woman says. She looks at him and she says, did I ask you for a son? And the answer is no. So you need to come and do something about it. Because it looks like he's dead. And you didn't tell me nothing about having a son for a few years and then him dying. You said I'd have a son. Now, I think it's funny, too, that she laid the boy on the man's bed. Because <laughs> you know what she's also thinking? In case I go there and he happens not to be there, he's going to come by here and try to turn into sleep. And before he can sleep, he's going to have to do something about the dead body. So, see, this woman's not only is she, she is smart, you know what I'm saying? And she says, and I know him because she's known him by now. He's not going to just let my son lay there and dead or he's not going to take him out and bury him. 
He'll bring that boy back to life. So the whole thing, what happens is, <clears throat> the prophet says to his servant, go there and you know, lay my staff on him or whatever, you know. And, <laughs> and she looks at him and says, that's all right, he can go, but I'm staying right here till I hear word he's alive. So then the prophet decides to go with her because, you know, here's the other thing. You ever notice in Scripture verse where it says, knock and it shall be open, ask and you shall receive? Well, in the Greek it says it this way, keep on knocking and keep on knocking and keep on knocking and keep on knocking and keep on asking and keep on asking, keep on asking till it's answered. You ever remember that song we used to sing? Till the answer comes, you got to keep praying, keep praying. You guys don't know that one? Oh, man, we're going to have to get you some country up here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. How many of you know? Keep on praying. Keep on asking till that answer comes. And she said, you can send him if you want to, but I'm staying right here till I hear word back. So he goes on with her. It says the prophet goes up there, shuts the door, lays on top of the boy, and he comes back to life. Notice before, I think it's interesting at the end of here, because it says before she shut the door and left. This time when she shuts the door, she's got her son in her arms. The dream that she had left there is now resurrected, and she comes out with it. And see, this is the thing. When you trust God, and when you believe him, I don't care how long it's been since God spoke that to you. I don't care if he spoke it to you when you were a child and now you're 60 years old. Right. If God spoke it, yes. he still means yes. for you to do it. That's right. Good work. If there's a business that he's told you, if you'll start this business and you knew it was God, then I guarantee you that business will make it. I had a guy say one time, he said, there was two hot dog stands in New York City. One on one corner and one on the other. This guy over here selling hot dogs. No different than the guy across the street. But yet he's selling ten times as many hot dogs. Guy walks over and he goes, what's your secret? And he said, to what? He said, How many, won't you sell so many hot dogs? He said, it's because I love hot dogs. He goes, what's that have to do with it? And he said, I love hot dogs so much, I push hot dogs. Yeah. The other guy's just doing it for a living. Yeah. You want a hot dog? Got a hot dog over here. The other guy was out there going, man, you got to have my hot dogs. They're the best one. I'm telling you what, you eat one of these hot dogs, you won't want anything else. Yeah. Right? Yeah. See, it's what you believe in is what motivates you to get up every day and do what you do. And because we believe we're called to ministry of these pastors and these missionaries, because we love them and we want to see them prosper, we want to see them help, we want to see them recover. Listen, I'll have Susie come. Susie, come on up here, honey. But <coughs> Susie said this earlier, and it's true. <coughs> if you could just spend a week with us or whatever to watch how these pastors change from the time they come to the time they leave, it is amazing. I mean, uh, amazing. You know, we've had so many pastors come there. We have this one pastor. He comes twice a year. He pays the other week he comes. He goes, oh, no, I'm, I'm coming twice a year. I don't care what it costs me a second week. I'm coming, you know. But he'll come for another week. But he was telling us a story about when he first started coming. He said when he first came, he was ready to quit the ministry. He said, that's it. I, I'm leaving the ministry. I'm just coming here to get God's approval, you know. But he went down by our cross. We have this large cross on the property. He went down at the cross, and he said it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He was just saying, God, you know, I think you're going to help me with my next step. And once I leave ministry, what I'm going to be doing, you know, and all that. He said the next thing he remembers, it was 6 o'clock the next morning, and he woke up. He fell asleep at the cross and slept all afternoon all the way to the next morning. He said when he got up, he said he felt like he'd been asleep for a month. He said, I don't know if coyotes sniffed me, his snakes crawled over me. He said, I don't know. He says, all I know is when I woke up, he said, I had this, uh, he said, I felt like I was completely refreshed. And he said, and I knew that I was called to ministry. Now he pastors, you know, his church, it's in Pittsburgh, Kansas. He runs three services on a Sunday. 
<laughs> I mean, church is just busting out the seams, you know what I'm saying? And he is just so excited about ministry. But we hear this story over and over and over again. There's something about it, and the pastors can tell you, this is it's not coming from us. But there's something different about that property. I can't tell you about it, but when you pull onto the property, there's something different about it. You know what I'm saying? It's not like any place else. There's this, and, and what's so cool about it is the cottages on it don't have Wi-Fi. They don't have cable. They don't have any of that. We call it, you disconnect to reconnect with God. And some of them, when they come, they'll tell us, you know, oh, you don't have Wi-Fi? Well, I can't stay here. You know, like that. But by the end of the week, you know what they tell us? Don't ever get it. Don't get it. Because they said, that's the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, amen. So you want to share what you're saying? We on him? I don't think you're. I know. Okay, it's a yellow light. Oh, that. There we go. Okay, there we go. Anyway, if he has dropped it in your heart, uh, Carmen had a, a song that he did years ago, and God uh, mm -hmm. reminded me of this. It says, "The desire is a confirmation. The destination is there. God wouldn't have put it in your spirit if it wasn't going nowhere." Mm -hmm. Yep. A desire is that confirmation. It confirms what God has told you. And that destination is there. Because God won't share those things with you if he hasn't already gone before you and prepared that. Yep. Right? And he will also give you provision. The, um, the thing, for that, what is that? Um, manifestation? What is the manifestation? Uh -huh. Oh, preparation. Preparation is the key to manifestation. The key to mm -hmm. manifestation. Yep. And also, I share with the first service that, you know, what I loved about this Shunammite woman, too, is when she laid her son upon the bed and shut the door. I think also she didn't want, I don't know what happened to the, mm -hmm. I didn't, we never did talk about that, about the husband. How come he, did he not, he didn't know he was dead? No, <laughs> but anyway, maybe he was just trying to keep it. But, maybe but she, she didn't knew to keep it quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but she really protected, she didn't want any of that doubt and unbelief right. going around because right. she wasn't going there. But what I loved about what she did, she wasn't denying the fact that she had a dead son. She knew he died. I mean, she, but, she, but, you know, um, she didn't deny the fact that her son was dead. But what she was doing with everything that she did, she was declaring God's power in that. Isn't right. that awesome? Exactly. So, you know, I would yep. just encourage you, you know, I, you know, I know you're going through things. We all go through things, sickness and disease and your jobs, your families, whatever. You know, don't deny that, but just declare God's power in that and watch him work. And it's just the most awesome amazing thing yep. that he does and Amen. i think i think too what the lord spoke to my heart there when she's talking is some of the times we think that god won't use us because of what we've done like in other words you know listen folks i'm telling you right now out of all the people god could have picked if i if i if i would have been god i would have been the last person i would have picked to have done this because you know there's nothing that i've done or anything else that's any different than anybody else i i struggle with the same struggles everybody else goes through got to deal with the same things and all that but i think what happened was god asked me to do something and i was just crazy enough to do it you know what i'm saying like he said you know will you do this you know and everything else and it was like yeah i'll do it you know because i told him when i came back into fellowship with the lord i'd made a promise to god i said god whatever you tell me to do i'll do it and and i've held to that you know if he's told me to do something i tried to do that you know and I think that's really what it comes down to. But you can't let the enemy also tell you that things that maybe you've done or, or things in your past will keep you from doing the ministry today. That's not true. You know, all of us have a past. All of us, I have things we'd like to erase, you know what I'm saying, and do away with. Uh, how many of you ever, now I'm not promoting the movie because I, I don't even remember it. It was so long ago. But anybody remember that movie Cannonball Run? Remember that? There's this old movie, and it's having this race across the country or something. But at one line in the movie, I remember. And it was two of the Frenchmen, and they're getting in their car. And they, the one gets in, and the other grabs the rearview mirror, and he throws it out. And the one goes, oh, what you doing with our mirror? And he says, oh, what's behind us? It doesn't matter. It's just what's ahead of us. Yeah. They don't care what's back there. He says, if they're behind us, that's not our problem. It's who's ahead of us, you know. And that's kind of what you've got to do with your life. 
is you got to say, you know what, I'm jerking the rear view mirror off because it doesn't matter. It's only what's up ahead of me, you know. And so, and, and I know some of you, and, and like I said, first service, we do this. I know sometimes people, you know, you can have a prayer line, but, you know, sometimes people, like on stuff like this, they're afraid to come forward, or they really don't want to come forward because they're afraid maybe other people will start asking them, well, what'd you go up for, you know, or, or what was you, what, what's God told you? And sometimes those things are very personal, and sometimes, you know, you're still at that stage where you're going, I, I want prayer for this, but I don't know if I can do this or not, you know. And so, but if you want Susie and I to pray with you or whatever after the church, that, that is fine. You know, you just come up here. We'll be glad to pray with you, you know. But, you know, also as Susie was uh, talking there for just a moment, uh, does somebody care? Can you come up and play on the piano for just a second? The Lord spoke to me something, too, about somebody, and, you know, and I, I want to give this opportunity. You know, I don't want to let this pass, you know. Um, but as Susie was talking, you know, the Lord told me, he said, somebody has and and i don't know what's happened or whatever i don't know if this is recent or what but said their heart is just broken you know and the lord is here to heal the brokenhearted you know and so if that's you today you know and and, and you know if i if it's you that i'm talking to but i and i don't know who it is god just said there's someone here that has a broken heart and i don't know if it's because of maybe words that were spoke to you or something that's happened recently or something but God just wants to heal you this morning he doesn't want you leaving that way you know so if that's you you come on up here I'd love to pray with you and I, I like I said I have no idea what it's about or anything else and it really doesn't matter it's between you and God but God said he will heal you of that broken heart this morning so if that's you while she's playing just come on up here and I'd love to pray with you okay Can you turn my mic off?
Stand to your feet, if you will, and we're going to dismiss. And I want to remind you that this is our mission Sunday, and so some of the guys will be back in the back either with a, uh, one of the offering baskets back there. We'll put one up here as well, and you can just drop your missions offering in. If you want to specify uh, any of the missionaries or the orphanages that we support and work with, or for the brook, just write the brook, and, and that'll go to Steve and Susie for the for the work there toward the pastors. Um, if you want prayer, if you've got a, a dream that needs to have uh, life breathe back into it, the, 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 the text of the message this, this day, then we'll be here for a while, and Steve and Susie will be here, and we'll pray with you. Um, put your hand up this way, and let's, let's speak blessing over the brook. And let's thank the Lord for what He's spoken to you. Don't, don't give up on what God has spoken to you. Don't, don't, don't walk away from it and say, well, it's dead, it's over with it. it. It can never come back. It's not over even when it's over. That's the story we find from Abraham. That's the story we find from Lazarus. That's the story of the brook. Father God, we love you. Thank you for your word and thank you for your promise. The power of your word, Lord God things that we see in our time and in our way and in our day, Lord God, our seasons, Lord God, they are, our ways are not your ways so often. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And you're always getting us ready for things you've got ready for us. And sometimes we're not ready for what you have spoken to us, but you are preparing us. And we get, we get ahead of what you've planned sometimes. Sometimes the enemy comes along to try and steal, to try and stop what you're doing, to bring death into something that you've ordained, but you are life. You are the way, the truth, and the life, and you give life where there is death. We thank you for that. And we speak blessing over the brook. We speak blessing over Steve and Susie and over those ministers, those pastors, those missionaries, those evangelists that they will minister to there. Lord God, may they be refreshed and restored, renewed, and then return back to the work, Lord God. Father, we give you praise and we thank you for this day. Bless our missionaries all over this globe, Lord God. Thank you for our orphans. Thank you for Guatemala, the shadow of his wings, Lord God, taking care of our little kids down there. Thank you, Lord God, for what you've allowed our, our lives to be involved in the ministry and the call. We pray for the trip to Uganda this coming spring. For those that should go on this trip, Lord God, speak to their hearts. Father God, thank you for orchestrating that thing. And we give you praise. Dismiss us now in your love. In Jesus' name, everyone that agreed said amen. Thank you for being at Westside. Thank you for those that are watching, tuned in. God bless you. We'll see you here, there, or in the air.